They were farmers. They took this area down here in the Duwamish River uh, area because that was a fertile valley where they could do farms. The, the second group that came along a little bit later settled out here near Alki, which they then pronounced Alki, Alki Point. Um, and it was terrible winds. It was a really dumb place to try to build a town. So they moved across the bay over here, and, and the rest, as they say, is sort of this history. But wow, that's right. yeah, that, that's that's what it was originally called. Um, the, the the native inhabitants of this area were, were the Duwamish people. Um, we have a lot of misconceptions from TV and movies. We think of things as tribes or you know, F troop with the chief and all this sort of thing. And their, their ethnography was a little bit different than that. They were, they were more along the lines of family bands, and they intermarried intentionally with, with other groups. So for example, you have the Duwamish people over in here. Over across the other side, you have the Duwamish, which were sort of like cousins of each other. They had a central figure who headed up both of these large groups, and his name, and I can't pronounce it properly in the Lashutsi, but we refer to him as, as Seal, I was anglicizing further into the name Seattle. But the Duwamish had habitation all the way along here. They had a major village down in what is now Renton, and they were the people who lived up in the Lake Washington area. And unfortunately, we don't know a whole heck of a lot about the earlier periods, because what happened is, when you first started out in the Spanish and the, the English kind of started to touch the area at the end of the 18th century, they brought with them various diseases that were rather catastrophic. So by the 1840s, 1830s, when you had Hudson's Bay coming into the area of Puget Sound, and in the late 1840s, you started to get Americans uh, it, was a, it was a tiny number of the population that had been there, say, a hundred or so years before. So there, and even when they were at their full strength, these are hunter-gatherers, which require a lot of land per individual. So it was a sparse population to begin with. But they were the people of Lake Washington. And I want to point this out. This is a little bit better now, but essentially the same thing. And what we now call the city of Renton was then an Indian village. Um, that was a, a Duwamish uh, a settlement there that was that was big and thriving. Um, there, most most of them were moved as a result of the 1856, 1855-1856 Treaty Wars. But the first white homesteader type guys that came here tended to be bachelors, and a lot of them married Native women, they married Native Duwamish women. And it was pretty well accepted, nobody really had a problem with it, but then when American women started coming and seeing these guys married to Indian ladies, they didn't like it. And the next thing, you know, if any of you were old enough to remember the TV show, Here Come the Brides, where they, they bring the women from the Civil War, ravaged East Coast, to bring them to Seattle as brides, that really happened. Um, so th that that happened was frowned on as time went on. But the women, who, the native women, who were married to American men didn't have to leave. They were able to stay in the area. Um, so I like to look at this this little lady over here. Uh, her name was Anna Tuttle. She was married to a white settler named. Abner Tuttle, that was her second husband. Her first husband was a man named Bigelow. And Bigelow found coal about 1854 down in Renton. She, was a, as a young woman, was living in that village down there. So they got married um, and actually had a son who was, whose name was also uh, Bigelow, of course. And then Bigelow died. So she took a second husband, who was also an American, whose name was Abner Tuttle. For a long time, I thought we had a picture of him, but it turns out that picture of him wasn't him. It was his son, and all that in the stand. But never mind that. Um, so they actually lived in what is now the Houghton area. But she, as a girl, had grown up along the lake doing hunter-gatherer kinds of things. Now, she had a sister that was a year or two younger than her, who uh, we don't have any pictures of, but her, her, her anglicized name was Ellen. 
And she married a man named, or she didn't marry, she cohabitated with a white settler named Gardner Proctor, and, who was from Maine. And uh, I actually, the, their last name was Canna. Uh, their dad was a Skagit, who was kind of a Skagit equivalent of CL. And um, their, their mom was a Duwamish. And they, again, they used to intermarry for political reasons. Because if, if your brother in law is the next tribe over, you're going to be a lot less likely to want to attack. And that was kind of like he had an with the royal family marrying each other to try to prevent wars. So he refers to her when he, when he finally dies um, in the late 1890s. He's been with this woman for 30 years. Uh, he has to refer to her in his will as Ellen Cannon, the Indian woman who has been my housekeeper for a number of years. Because they, they weren't able to legally marry. Not, well, he, they were able to be legally married here, but the problem was he was actually still married in Maine, had left his wife back there, never bothered to get divorced, so it kind of complicated things. But uh, by 1880, we see Ellen and Gardner, and they have the mother, uh, uh, Mary Kenham, who had been married to the, and she was, she, they, again, they were like a scattered version of what Chief Seattle was. She's living with them on Mercer Island, and at that time, they're the only residents of, of Mercer Island. So we've got Anna in the Hope area, and we have her sister Ellen down here. And they, they are sort of the first ladies in my mind of Lake Washington, because they were that bridge between the white culture coming and, and the native culture. Um, and they were kind of making the best of, of both worlds. Interestingly, her, I just found this out recently. Her, her son from her first marriage actually got a homestead in um, kind of uh, Rose Hill, down 85th kind of area. So he, he was, because of being half white, he was able to take advantage of the, of the homestead laws, which, which full blood natives weren't allowed to. Um, just to put things into perspective, this is a picture of Seattle in 1870. So down here you have Jesper's Wharf. This is that Pioneer's Point area I was describing. This would be pretty much Capitol Hill. I mean, pardon me, um, uh, Pioneer Square area now. But that is what Seattle looked like in 1870 when they finished doing the survey for what's called the township we live in. Um, there's something put into place called the Cadastro Survey System. If you've ever heard references to property as section range and township, that was how it was surveyed, and a particular township would have to have been surveyed and, and signed off before it was available for homesteading. So over in Seattle, and in the very southern part of the east side of Lake Washington, like down by Renton and Newcastle, those opened up very early. But the area that is now Brooklyn and Bellevue didn't become available for homesteading until 1870. And that's when we first started to people, well, we had some squatters over here. 1869, but for the most part, that's when they can legally come over and start claiming land. And I just like to do that picture because you get a sense for how primitive Seattle was. At the time, people were coming over here and staking out their 80 or 160 hour, 160 acre homestead claims. This is, this is Township 25. This is what we're in right now. Right now, we're about here. That's Moss Bay, that's Euro Bay. And I just want to throw that up here because that's those lines with the people's names, those are those are all the names of the different people that claim those parcels of land. What year is that right there? Uh, th this was a map from 1870, but then they filled it in by hand as people came along and claimed the land. So you'd have to go down to Olympia. You'd, you'd have to literally stake out your claim with stakes in the corners, and then go down to Olympia and file a paperwork to, to be the one that says, I'm going to be able to get this, I'm in line here, and you had to do a certain number of things to the land to be able to get it for free, or you can pay $2.50 an acre and have it in a much shorter period of time without needing to do too many improvements. Um, there's kind of a mix. Some, some more people proved up their land, others of them buy by the acre. Now, that's not a big chunk where nobody's claimed like this. Oh, so that's a good, yeah, that, this is what's called school land. Which means that was held in reserve by the legislature to be sold or used in some way to finance schools. Oh, okay. So it's kind of ahead of the curve thinking for back then. And it, it, it didn't mean, I mean, sometimes they would sell it, sometimes they would sell the timber, but the revenues were always supposed to go to the school. So that was, from even decades before we were a state, that was kind of a, 
concern that they have. And how much lighter are the beam supporters then? Like okay. Uh, this is what the, the number here is a section, and that's a that's a square mile. Okay. And then you break it down by um, quarter sections, you know, and fractions thereof. And if, if land was never planted, like you can still go to Winita or some of these areas where the legal description is actually, you know, uh, 100 feet of the southwest corner of the, you know, it's, it's, it's that family style of a side to that. Because what would normally happen is somebody would buy a community about this piece of land and then file a plaque, which kind of supersedes the original lengthy description. It's easy when you're getting these big giant blocks of it, but by the time you're dealing with the size of blocks we have now, it's really complicated if you're having to describe land in those terms. Uh, this is Juanita Bay, and at the time this map was made, we've got a little rascal here who was early. His name was Hubbard, Martin Hubbard, and that's his cabin right here, which is about where Juanita Village is now. And his buddy was over here. His name was Henry Goldmeyer. His brother, William Goldmeyer, had a homestead over at Sandpoint. So he just came across the lake. They came around 1870 and were the first, uh, the first guys to get this land, 160 acres each. You think today about the value of 320 acres around Winnie the Bay? And those two guys had it, they're 18, 19 years of age at the time. And we think now of an 18, 19 year old. Think of an 18, 19 year old back then who built a cabin out of the woods, out in the middle of nowhere, playing in land, doing all this stuff. And you know, Different breed of cat back in those days. <laughs> um, this is one of the fun things that happens to a lot of the research that, that we did and Frank and the other history geeks like to do is when you come across original documents, it's wild for me as a, as a history guy to actually see the hand of these two guys. That's those are their signatures on the document. Um, Henry Goldmeyer didn't hold on to his land very long. It, it, there was a now we call them flippers, but, but that was kind of a thing back then, too. You'd get in, you'd homestead the land, you'd be there for a year or two, then you do the quick sale, sell it to somebody, and off you go to do something else. So Hubbard stayed on it the rest of his life. Goldmeyer flipped it within a couple of years. A few years later, he died, he fell off a log raft, uh, floating down the Sammamish River, hit his head in the ground. Just freak accident kind of thing that used to happen in those days. Martin Hubbard went on to become uh, what we would call a mail carrier now, but it's a little more complicated back then. Basically, his route, the mail would start here in Seattle, it would be taken to Madison Park, which was then called Laurel's Shade. It was the estate of a prominent judge named John McGilvra. So Hubbard would start over here in a rowboat. He'd roll along over here to the points, drop the mail, hum up here to the, the hub. They call the post office Hubbard after the other. Sometimes you'll read things that say when it was called Hubbard. The post office was called Hubbard. It was always called when he had. Then off he goes here in his rowboat all the way down to Sammamish River, which back then hadn't been straightened, so it was all windy, all over the place in the valley out there. All the way down into Lake Sammamish, and then all the way down here to Squaw, which we now know is Issaquah. So that was, that was him in a robo doing all that as his male job. 20 days now. Yeah, how long was that? And that what guy, look like? he must have been in great shape. Yeah. <laughs> how long, how long that was that? Was that the way I don't know how long he was that. He, he didn't leave, he never married. So he didn't have any kind of journals or anything <laughs> else. They all the time. <laughs> yeah, he just, and, and he was, uh, he was considered odd. One of his neighbors was the guy named Dora Forbes, the namesake of Forbes Lake, Forbes Creek. Uh, his son found him wanting to be, et cetera, et cetera. And he was testifying at, at uh, Hubbard's probate hearing. And one of the questions was, was Mr. Hubbard a strange man? He said, I would call him Juan. So, you know, but that's his marker out of great at Lakeview. I found that a couple of years ago. It was ahead of his time as a flat stone. He must have anticipated Juan Moore's. <laughs> so, one question I get fairly often is where did the name Wayne Bay come from? And we don't know entirely whether it was from a very popular song of that era called Nita Wanita, but we know the lady who named it that. Now this is Charles and Mary Terry, T-E-R-R-Y. Charles Terry was one of the original Denny party that settled out at Alton um, in, in 1851. 
Mary Jane, she went by Jane. Her last name, her maiden name was Russell. So in her day, she was Jane Russell, like the actress from Harry News movies from a long time ago. Uh, she came in a wagon train shortly after the, the Denny party. And um, they, they had been married. Chief Seattle officiated at their ceremony. They were married um, in a canoe off Port Madison. And it was kind of a, it was kind of a big deal. Um, he was very industrious. And there was an alcoholic doctor that was an early founder of Seattle whose name was David Maynard. And Maynard had this great claim that was like much of the southern part of downtown that would be worth a ton of money. Terry had this land over at Alki, which was this windswept, crappy place. Terry traded Maynard. They swapped the land. So then Terry has all this prime downtown real estate, and he was a wheeler dealer. He started really making it happen. Um, so he got the better of that deal. He died in 1867 of tuberculosis, which they then called consumption, at the right old age of 37. Left her a widow, but she was the wealthiest woman in Seattle. And she got married. She had a bunch of kids, she had like five kids, a bunch of whom were so young. She married on the rebound to this guy that was not one of the original settler type guys. He was a new arrival to Seattle. And I actually looked at the um, at the new Seven Regional Archives, at the original court papers of the divorce, where all the details were, because in those days to get a divorce from somebody, yeah, that would cause of action. You couldn't just say we don't want to marry anymore. And the second guy, I mean, he was really horrible. What, what he did, um, he, he would do things like hire up a chair for days, call her names. This is brutal, horrible stuff. But she was somebody that had been married to somebody that was very prominent and that everybody liked who had first been there. So by the time she divorced him, she divorced him in absentia because he disappeared. Nobody knew where he was. And I, I don't know for a fact, but it's just kind of interesting that he's treating the, the wife that everybody really liked, that their buddy, horribly, and then he just vanished. So this is a, her second husband? This photo was her first husband. The man I'm describing is her second husband. I don't think so. there's any pictures of it. He died. He died of uh, tuberculosis when she married a second guy. Yeah. yeah. So then after he died, she eventually married a third guy, but he was somebody that had been friends with the first guy, and he was a nice guy, and they had a couple of years together before she died at the right old age, also of 37. But for her summer residence, she bought Goldmeyer's claim on Juanita, on Juanita Bay. And we have references, Lolita dug out a, an old journal description from a home settler, Henry French, who described going to Mrs. Terry's ranch at Juanita, W-A-N-N-I-T-A. So that was, the people who would have this habit back then of calling their, their estate or their property, they would give it a name. So I think that's kind of what, what she called her, her place. She died after having named it Juanita, um, but it stayed in the, in the family until the end of the 20th century. Some of her kids still had land in there, um, like where Juanita Village and stuff is now, um, into like the 1920s and 1930s. So she had a sad story for a while, but in the end, it all came out okay. It sounds like the second husband got what he had coming to him. That was her house in Seattle. That was her main house, and it was considered the most elaborate house in Seattle in the 1860s. That was a big deal for back then. That was like a equivalent of a multi-million dollar, you know, Hunt Point Mansion or something. Um, this is a, I was talking about homesteads. This is the kind of paperwork that you would get once you had filed for your homestead. There was a bureaucratic process involved in it. It took a matter of years, and you had to do a lot of of filings about what kind of improvements you made and this sort of thing. And of course, that's assuming you had to pay for it outright. Martin Hubbard and his wife Eliza, they lived uh, roughly where Peter Kirk Elementary School is, kind of at the very base of the Highlands Hill, kind of in the Door Kirk Highlands area. Um, these are just some of the documents that we see and that we learn a lot from. Here he's describing all the things he has. So that's helpful for somebody like me, because I can see what kind of animals they had, the dimensions of their buildings, what they were made out of, what tools they had, etc. Uh, that's his wife when she was a young woman. That's uh, Eliza Clark. That's Marvin Clark toward the end of his life on the porch of their house 
Um, over in that neighborhood, they eventually built a, a nice frame house. That's him with his granddaughter about 1910. Um, just to give you an example of what life was like back then, this is Martin and Eliza in the early 1880s. They have uh, three kids and a baby on the way, and within a couple of days, all three died of tuberculosis. And you know, imagine that, you're, you're off in the woods here and, and you got your three kids and they're dying, and, you know, there's nothing you can do. You, there's no, you know, doctors or, or anything. Um, there, there was a movie on the cable, it was called The Homesman or something like that, and they had a scene where three kids dying of diphtheria. And I often wondered if somebody in Hollywood heard about this or, or something. It did happen periodically, but just the way it was, and putting them out in the shed, and, Everything else was just too, too similar. But the baby did live. Um, no, wait a minute. It's a tertiary down there that they died, he died of the same disease as the other You said tuberculosis. I mean, I don't know. Tuberculosis was terrible. It is diphtheria. I'm sorry, I spoke. Thank you for catching that. Now, yeah, it was diphtheria. In your book, wasn't there a part of this where they actually took, they, they took one of the living children and Rode across to Madison. The, okay, that was the baby. The, these three, these three all died on the homestead and were and were buried out there. But she had the baby yeah. who survived. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, I'm gonna yeah, because yeah, right. we'll go go into that. But yeah, it was diphtheria. So if you know anything about diphtheria, it's incredibly horrible. The the kid basically is fixing it. We <laughs> people that don't like uh, vaccinations. Welcome to the 1800s. <laughs> Different story. Uh, this is uh, Eliza, and then they had two other kids afterwards. They had uh, a little son and a little daughter. And the oldest girl is the baby that survived. Her name was Lucy, but her nickname in the family was Louie. And that's Louie when she was a little bit older. And that's her. She was one of the first graduates of Brooklyn High School. That's her as a young woman at KT. And she married a guy who was a guy who was passing through town around the time Kirkland Incorporated in 1905. He was just going to come here for a little while, see his cousins, and then go to Alaska and see the adventure. He ran into her. He never left Kirkland again and became Kirkland's first town treasurer and held that position for about 40 years. Wow. So she kept it here by him on leave. And this is the, I do a tour every year of uh, the Brooklyn Cemetery, and this is the family marker. The little kids were exhumed and moved when, when the cemetery opened after 1890. And the whole, the whole family is in there together now. Um, this lady, this is me, after one of my tours, and I'm reading that. Unfortunately, this wonderful lady has passed away since this picture was taken. Ludi was the baby that lived. That's her granddaughter. Still in the area, still in Kirkland. You would turn over some rocks around here, you never know who you're going to run into. You run into somebody whose family's been here since the 1880s. But yeah, Patty, she, she gave a whole bunch of stuff for her duplication of the Kirkland Heritage Society. Really, really nice lady, and, and she spoke of that. But again, her, I think about that in my mind. You know, I knew her, and she knew her grandma, and her grandma was the baby that survived that horrible incident in 1882. Uh, this is uh, this is just an example of, of the kinds of documents. Well, it's kind of a broad transition for what we were just talking about. Um, we're starting to get some other settlement, particularly around in the Houghton area. Back in those days, Houghton and Juanita met. If, if you lived like where the Flux did or where Peter Kirk Elementary is now, you would say you lived in Houghton. Juanita, you could be anywhere. You could be up in Woodland and say you're in Juanita. You're Mercer Island, you're in the Juanita generation precinct. They weren't defined areas, they were just big. But Houghton was the, was the predominant name. This was a place called Lake House. Um, the family will correct you if you call it the Lake House. It's not called the Lake House, it's called Lake. And that was, that was here until the 80s. Um, that was over at Houghton. It's all been taken out now. It's kind of across from Houghton Beach, roughly. But that served as a kind of a hotel because uh, around the Houghton Beach area, if you came ashore there, there was a trail out through the woods over what is now Redmond, and that had been a native trail originally, so it was a natural thoroughfare area. But people stood out on the deck from that structure and watched the Seattle Fire in 1889. 
Uh, one of the great discoveries that we've had with uh, Kirkland Heritage Society was a couple of years ago. Uh, I was on eBay and I saw this uh, auction for some glass plate negatives. Come to find out, potent seller Harry French was an amateur photographer as far back as the late 1880s, early 1890s. And, and, and we just, they got the camera downstairs. They have his wooden camera. But somebody down in Chehala somehow got a hold of these glass plate natives of these photos that he had taken um, around the time the Peter Kirk boom was starting to happen. So needless to say, those were quite a treasure for us. This is Harry Fresh, and this is his mom and dad. Um, and they came from Maine and they had a joining um, homestead place in the, in the uh, Houghton area. So, like roughly from Carlin Point up north to about the Marsh Mansion area, it was all between, it was all French family homesteads. So he was in a great position to, to watch things. Um, this is a photo Harry French took of a, of a homestead cabin. This, this one was, uh, there are two women, I don't know if they were sisters or mother and daughter, their name was Davies. So you hear these things, oh, women couldn't own property in the old days, well, yeah, they could. As a matter of fact, women typically didn't homestead because there was massive physical labor necessary to improve property, but they couldn't legally do it. These two did. Um, this was up by, like, around an up market, like, around 18th or 19th Avenue, off to the, to the east. Um, and they ended up selling that, making a ton of money. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But that was, for some reason, Harry French took a picture of their cabin. But I'm glad he did, because it gives you a sense of how crude it was. And I don't know if they did it themselves, or if they paid somebody, or, or what, but that was their cabin on the Davies property. Harry French, if, if, if you've ever done the kind of manual labor, like splitting any kind of rails, or clearing stumps, even like a stump this big, digging that out, if you've ever done that, then imagine, Clearing a couple of acres of pasture without dynamite, without any kind of power tools, just with pick and shovel. So between that and the fence, I don't blame Gary for being proud of it and taking a picture of it. <laughs> you're, you're looking at incredible labor to make just that little clearing happen. This is a view from his property looking out at the lake. Um, there's a, it's a condo now, the Lakeshore condo is about where this was taken. That's uh, Hunts Point. Up there in the, in the distance in Seattle on the other side. That's his, his, his frame house. Um, it was the first frame house on the east side. It actually has been modified, but it still stands. It was moved closer down to Houghton, down sort of by where the cave used to be. But that was the, that was the house. And it's like today, you know, when it's in snow, everybody's got to take a picture of it. So did they. And he was from Maine, so he was used to snow, just wasn't used to seeing it here. Uh, this is just a funny picture because uh, what they're doing is that that bull's not ready to become a steer. Uh, but he thought that was important enough to take a picture of it, so that's what they were doing. Now think of the value of lakefront property today. In fact, then we're using it to cast great bulls. <laughs> so, in the to Seattle in the late 1880s, a guy named Lee Hunt, um, he, he made up the name Lee. His real name was Smith James Hunt, but he liked the name Lee better, so he called himself Lee Hunt. He had been, at a very young age, the uh, president of the Iowa Agricultural uh, University, which is Iowa State University today. He only lasted a year because he expelled some boys whose dads were very prominent. Uh, they'd gotten into a female teacher's uh, living quarters and gone through a stop and were drunk and making a big mess, and, and he, he just said, no, you're out of here. And that ended his career as the president of the Iowa Agricultural College. So he and his wife, Jesse Noble, uh, whose dad was a man, Henry Noble, who was a, a bar, had a barbed wire fortune. Barbed wire was a big deal in the uh, 1800s. They came out west to the Seattle area, and then, within almost no time, with no money out of his pocket, he, had, he became the controlling uh, partner and editor-publisher of the Seattle Post-Intelligence newspaper, which was then the, the main newspaper in town. And from the newspaper, he understood me at a really, at a really uh, interesting time, because from the, the newspaper, 
he became the main behind the scenes boss of the Republican Party. And in those days, the Republican Party ran everything here. These had been abolitionists. It was, it was kind of that era. Um, so he understood that he didn't want to be an elected politician. He wanted elected politicians to be indebted to him and to his immediate empire. He had a vision when he looked out at the area, and he saw the east side as an industrialized area um, that he had plans for. This is him in later life, and this is his, um, this is a, this is a, a friend of mine that's it's, uh, really good on railway research, and this is a freight document from 1890. Um, Hunt had a residency called Yarrow, on what is now Yarrow Point, but the point next to it had a bunch of really tall trees, so Jesse couldn't get a good view of Seattle, so he bought that point and cut the trees down, and it now is known as Hunt's Point, even though he didn't actually live there, he just cut down the trees. So, he wanted to industrialize the, the east side, and we're going to talk a little bit more about how he was going to do that, but he was going to have a railway that ran um, on the eastern side, and then he was going to have a variety of industries. And he knew in his mind that the centerpiece had to be a steel mill, which was huge at that time because of the, the expanding railroads. So, enter an Englishman named Peter Kirk, from Workington, England, who was a multi-generational iron maker, who really wanted to go out on his own. He'd been in business with his brothers, his dad, he was, he was the family company, but there were some things going on in England that made him want to come out to the United States. So he did. He came out starting in the late 1880s to sort of look around, and decided after looking at Pittsburgh and some other areas, that the Pacific Northwest would be a great place for him to go. What he wanted to do was set up another steel mill um, and make rails for, for a railroad, um, which was a huge, booming thing at that time. This is a sample. Um, that's downstairs, actually. We'll get into that. Um, this was made in their English facility and shipped over in 1887. But this is what they wanted to, to build. And in working to England, it was located on what was called Moss Bay, so it was the Moss Bay Iron and Steel Works. This is Peter Kirk at different stages of life, and that's him along with Lee Hunt. That's what he looked like. And just real quick, just this book just came out, and I'm better at selling other people's books than I am my own. This just came out as biography of Peter Kirk by Sandy Middleton, and she is the third great granddaughter of Peter Kirk. This is, is very well a footnote source. She went to um, England and was looking through the archives back there. She has some family more. There was a book written in 1875 by a lady whose name then was Arlene Neely called Our Foundering Fathers. If you can find it on eBay, it's really good. She did an awesome job for no internet. Um, she had advantage of some people living back then who had been around at that time, and she's writing them letters. But this really picks up the ball in the modern era where she left off. And, and Sandy's a really nice lady too, so if you get this on Amazon, it just came out. Uh, and it's particularly cool that she's a descendant. This is, uh, this is the Kirk family um, up in the San Juan Islands fishing. This is a little bit later, but it, it sort of gives you, uh, the reason I show this kind of out of sequence, that's what Peter looks like, just kicking around and going fishing. He's wearing a suit and a pith helmet. <laughs> there he is again with the pith helmet, the lunch bucket, and this is Walter Williams, his right hand man. Um, ultimately, Williams lived down at the property about where Monina Bay Park is right now. But Kurtz, to, in order to make uh, Bessemer steel, which is what he wanted to do, the three primary raw ingredients you need iron ore. You need a grade of coal, which was known as coking coal, which burned at a much hotter temperature than just your run-of-the-mill coal. So it could be a little bit difficult to find, even if there's coal all over the place around here, which there used to be. Um, getting the coking coal is a little bit tricky. And then you need lime, which is used as a flux. So basically what's going to happen is you can grind up the iron ore, and you, you put lime in it to get the impurities out, which are called slag which is why if you look at old shots of Pittsburgh, they have giant slag piles. Um, 
So what he needed to do was figure out a place he could put a steel mill where he would have access to these resources. When it came to the iron ore, it just so happened that the, that the head guy of Seattle, Arthur Denny, Arthur Armstrong Denny of the Denny Party, owned what were called the Denny Iron Mines. And if you're driving um, across the summit, headed east, going over Snoqualmie Pass, as you kind of curve to the right, Alpatol is over here. There's a big mountain here on your left. That's called Denny Mountain. And if you like hiking or anything like that, you may have been down below and taken the Denny Creek Trail, which goes out along Denny Creek. That's where those mines were. You drive right by them all the time. You could go to where they were now and look up, and there's I-90 up on top of you. But that was where they were going to get the, the, the uh, steel ore. Um, the coking coal was a little bit up in the air. He actually had buying some mines down by the Raging River. And many of his notes that, that we have downstairs, he's talking about assay results from these different coal samples because that was a huge thing for him, was finding the coal, or that, finding the coal that was sufficient to get the heat he needed for these Bessemer converters that they used. And of course, actually, the lime was easy. You could get that almost anywhere uh, around here. There was a lot of deposits of it. And he ended up buying property on San Juan Island where there's huge quantities of, of lime. So that wasn't really a, a problem. But he had to put it all together to be able to, to make the seal the way he wanted to. This was their house, uh, which was just kind of right above there, a ways. It was torn down in the 19th. It was called Fur Grove. Um, but it was pretty well remembered and kind of dominated over there. Matt? Yes. Why wasn't that house saved? Was there no Because oh, Burke, Burke and Farrar wanted to turn it into two lots. And so they, they got they got it and tore it down. And his kids didn't care for whatever reason. I know. They said it was drafty and, you know, this kind of thing. Um, this is the original Kirkland Town plat of, of what the original vision was. You can see there's some gaps, but basically what you have is the west of Market area, the North Kirk area, and it kind of stops here. That what would be the downtown area wasn't actually a part of the, our, our modern downtown was not a part of their original vision as the downtown area. Though they did have a wharf and stuff there, they knew that the, the lake was going, to be, was going to be important. But this plot was a big deal. All the people that do land plots at that time were raving over the quality of it. Um, this big open area up above here, where it's blank, that was actually purchased, most of it, by one of the richest men in America at the time. His name was Joshua Montgomery Sears. No connection to Sears and Robot. And um, if you see the building up here on the right corner, it says Cedars across the top. That was the bank building. He built that. Um, it was that the Davies ladies also sold their land out to, to Sears. And with, with Kirk and Hunt's uh, project out here, because that's what ultimately happened, Kirk was looking at Ellensburg and a few other areas, and he ran into Hunt, who was described by contemporaries as a man of very peculiar talents. He was a salesman, salesman. So he convinced Peter Kirk to locate on Lake Washington, by the way, we call the town. And it was a giant boat. It was people around the United States, their eyes were on Kirkland, the coming iron metropolis of the world. It was a huge deal, a boom ensued. People were, were snapping up land, speculators all around here. Um, some of the big real estate builder dealers at the time just anticipating this, this massive facility coming in. Uh, one of Hunt's ventures, I don't know how you can see it, this is Leshite Park, about 1890. That's a steamboat called the Kirkland, which was owned by one of Hunt's companies. His company also owned a street railway that ran up Yesler Street, came up Yesler, and then turned around and went down Jackson Street. So it would take you right up to Leshite, where you would get on the steamboat Kirkland, go chugging up to the town side of Kirkland and where you would have an opportunity to buy real estate and invest. So he was kind of ahead of his time on that. You know, the whole idea, you know, like later timeshare people or something, you know, come out and do this little vacation place, all you have to do is listen to the sales pitch. He, he had it down in the 1890s. So, when everything got into motion here, what needed to happen was a massive clearing operation the railroad was necessary to, uh, to ship the steel mill to the rails out and to bring the raw materials in. But the railroad, because of the grade, couldn't make it down to the water, which was the original plan. So they negotiated, 
And the, because of where the railroad could go, they ended up locating the mill up by Costco on Rose Hill. Kind of where Petco is now roughly. And this, what they're doing is, this would be, um, this, this, this building right here is where this little brick building was. Right now, we're about here. So this is like west of Market, and this is Norfolk. And what they're doing is they're knocking down these big old growth trees, and in many instances, they're burning them right there where they lie, because they're in such a hurry to get all the land to This over here on the side is a, is a sawmill, and it was from that sawmill that a lot of recruiters were going out and doing all this stuff. They drag in what they could and what they could cut, but they had so much timber, they just had to burn a whole bunch of it right there where it fell. And if you know anything about lumber, if you could imagine this old growth of beams and stuff, you could have gotten out of that and just got rid of it. They had no shortage of it. Um, ultimately, this would be like the Kirkland, you know, like where the Kirkland um, Green Park is, and that kind of stuff would be about here. Uh, a few years later, we're looking down Market Street. So there's this little building that is uh, the one over here now on the corner. This would be the end of Market Street, uh, where they had the company Wharf. And the lake was nine and a half feet uh, higher at that time. This was before Lake Washington Ship Canal opened up in 1916 and brought the lake nine and a half feet. So Moss Bay was more of an actual bay. But here you can see the original uh, homesteader of this area. His name was. Um, um, Run away. Anyway, there was a bunch of them. Um, their original uh, buildings were here. That's his barn and stuff that ultimately got torn down. Now it's in. It was now it's in. Um, this is right. Okay, so we would right now be roughly here. And that's the building on the corner again. Where the, uh, that was the first little brick office they built. So this is Market Street, and they're laying down wooden planks to pave Market Street in this photo. And that's a crew of guys that's tons of money from the time or into that, you know, for, for that kind of labor to, to do that. Matt, Market Street, was that light? Yeah. And it was all wood? Yeah, originally. How far? Um, to the brick buildings, which haven't been built yet. That's well, what it's just happened? Yeah, because that's a really, really, really good point. Because what happened is you would go, they thought the downtown would be over here where they end up with the brick building. <laughs> But 7th Avenue, which was then called Piccadilly, was the direct route to the mill. So they, that was going to be the little business district was up there, up over here, instead of down on the, on the lake. Huh. And that, that building it was gone before my time, but there could be some people in here that remember that. It was, it was there for a long time, until uh, the very early 60s. And it became, a, obviously, a telephone company building and variety of other things. And it was also the first, uh, the upstairs was the first Kirkland City Hall. That's where they held the council meetings in starting in 1905. This little wooden structure right next to it was where a famous actor from the 30s was uh, born. He was Lanny Ross. He was like a singer, you know, B-movie guy from the day that nobody remembers. This is some of the examples of what they've got downstairs, handwritten notes by Peter Kirk. Of, of his, he was a pretty meticulous guy. He actually held a number of patents. He was an inventor. He was, he was clearly a pretty brilliant guy. He was more the technician, and Hunt was the wheeler dealer. Hunt was the, the razzle dazzle guy, the media guy. Uh, here's just another example of stuff coming to the Moss Bay Iron and Steel Company by rail. What they would do is they would take it to the town of Gessler, which was on Union Bay, over near Husky Stadium. Put it on a sea boat, bring it across the lake to the wharf at the foot of Market Street, and then haul all this stuff up to the mill. And a lot of it was heavy, pig iron and all kinds of heavy industrial equipment. This is them clearing land. We're looking east here toward Rose Hill. This is the mill in, in, in a stage of, of uh, completion early on. This is actually a materials bunker. This is Forbes Lake over here, and this is a sawmill, of course different than the sawmill that was on the water, but I talked about how the early uh, primary movers and shakers of Seattle had been involved in the Kirkland venture. Arthur Denny and then Henry Gessler paid the taxes, we don't know for sure if he already went, and paid the taxes on that sawmill. Um, and it was getting towards the end of his life, but he was involved in it too, and that was sawmill on Forbes Lake is what cut most of the timber used for the actual mill structures. Here we're looking at Forbes Lake. Again, we're standing at about 85th, looking down. The mill is over here, the steel mill. This is the saw.
sawmill. And what they're doing here is they're laying timber down as fill because all this is swamp. It's going, all this is like Costco parking lot now. And that was all, that was all uh, mud and skunk heavy. So they're taking these big old uh, old growth trees and just knocking them down and laying them there as, as punches, as, as fill. This is looking uh, south. So you've got the big materials bunker over here, which is where they're going to keep lime, uh, cooking coal, and steel ore. And then this is trestle work, because the train cars would come up along here and dump into there. And then this is uh, the first half of the mill facility. They were going to build half of it, get in operation, and then build a mirror image uh, west, on the west side, about four or five years down. Never got to that, but that was, uh, that was the build base. The, uh, the foundry is going to be on the left, and then on the right, you've got machine shop, that pattern shop, and, and that sort of thing. But again, you can't really see all that they were going to do because it wasn't really equipped yet. And they're, and they're doing excavation here for what they thought would be the additional building for engine house and, and stuff. That is a guy, his dog, I'm not sure who he is, but he's standing in front of that bunker. The bunker was like 315 feet long. Massive. This is facing the mill, uh, facing the east. So if you were to go to the Costco parking lot and then walk to the edge of it and go, there's that little Costco overflow parking lot on the other side of the road. There's a path right next to the Costco overflow parking lot. The path is sitting right away that is this. This was, this was seven, you kept going straight on this, you go down to 7th Avenue. So it leads right up to the mill. So you can still go there today and stand on that path and recreate this view up against the hillside. Only now you don't see a mill, but you see. You can still kind of tell. And um, if you look closely here, that's all stump cabbage. And the way it's shiny like that suggests this was probably taken in the spring. Here's the view from what is now Slater. Slater actually began as a railroad bed. Um, for the tracks to come down to the mill. And that's looking across Forbes Lake at the mill facility. This is a little bit later, because by then the, the railroad's in. This is the Kirkland pulling up to downtown. So again, we've got Market Street right here. And by now, the brick buildings are in place. And Kirk's house was over here, for Grove. And that's their little uh, wharf and warehouse. Uh, this is just a, a layout of the, of the railroad. Uh, there was a separate rail line back then that's different. So this is the modern one, which is the CKC. The old line was over, was over here. They were parallel, but they ended up... And again, Slater Avenue is the route of the original uh, the question of uh, One of our guys with uh, people here in society found this. This is a very rare table where you could actually catch a train in Seattle take it to Kirkland Junction, which was outside of Woodville. Whipplers was actually a guy named Weckler, which we now know is totally like, he had a shingle mill there. And then finally, the last stop was Kirkland, which meant up there by Costco. Uh, when the bottom started to fall out, you were heading into a national depression. One of the things that, that uh, Tacoma did, Tacoma was the bitter enemy, and they were trying to convince everybody Kirkland was a land scheme. It was just a speculation scheme. So they came up and did these pictures and published in the Tacoma News Tribune what we would now call a hit piece, claiming that Kirkland was just a big sham. And these are some drawings from that article. Those are cooling pits. My, my uh, elementary school pits principal, Russ Clinic, went to school up on Rose Hill in the 1920s. He said those, those holes were still there when he was a little kid. Uh, that's a view to the west. This would be uh, seventh here as a plank road. This is the True Blood House, which was along seventh. That is that, that's a happy story. It's going to be demolished, and the, the people that were going to demolish it gave a little time, found somebody who wanted it, and it got moved about a block or so away. So it's still standing up there. I talked about the depression. What ended up happening was a giant depression called the Panic of 1893. There was what's called a run on banks. We're not exactly sure why, if that was the sole reason, or if there were other things going on, or if the ship canal not getting built, or a variety of other factors, but the, the, the stock subscribers for Peter Kirk and Lee Hunt's venture started defaulting. The money ran out, and that was the end. They just didn't open back up again 
um, for after 1892 to, to get construction going again. Um, the, the mill fell into ruin. This is a KHS photo of a family up there in the 1910s playing in the ruins. That had been the bunker, and the kids are playing that. You see the beefy foundations and the beams from the old trip that they cut. Uh, some of the buildings left over from that year. This one was torn down when I was a little kid. This is where Leland Place is now with the modern building, but that was the original one. It was torn down at the gas station. We all know that building. That's what it, that was in the 40s. It was a furniture company by then. These buildings hung out, you know, and people just did other things with them. What happened in 1910 is uh, Kirk, Kirk and Hunt had, in addition to the steel company, they had a land company. So the land company still had assets. It sold what it owned in 1910 to two developers named Burke and Farrar. And tons of people in, in, in Kirkland have a land description. Burke and Farrar's plat number, you know, blank and blank. They, they owned everything, and it was them, it was they, who envisioned Kirkland as a suburb of Seattle, and that's when that started. Uh, this building is still there. This was their office. This would be Marina Park. This is a parking lot now. This is like where the coffee room is, and great choice, and stuff like that is over there. But it's been expanded, but that building is still there. Um, the top floor is like where the Seuss boutique is, and some of that stuff on Lake Street. Oh, uh, and these flowers were grown by some people in Sherwood. They sure were the KHS member there. Family's been doing stuff like that for forever. That's Peter Kirk's grave. He's buried up on San Juan Island. He died in 1916. He lived long enough to see the canal built and never, never saw his, uh, his mill. Uh, I'm going to probably, there's a lot more we can do. I'm going to probably cut it off here before I start talking about what happened afterwards with the ship building and everything because I'm really a little long. Does, does anybody have any questions? No? So, that picture of the Peter Kirk building, the car dealership, I didn't know that that building ever changed. And that that's bottom floor is entirely different than it is now. Of the, you mean where the art center is? Right. Yeah, that, we call it the Peter Kirk building. The people in the day didn't call it, there was a different building that they called the Peter Kirk building. It was next to the, what had been the hotel building. Did you guys live here prior to 65? When did we move here? When did we move here? No. It was probably gone by then. Um, it was a gas station probably when we got here. They tore that the, the Jackson Hotel down um, in, in 1965. It was actually Jackson uh, was the grandfather of the governor, Dan Evans. Um, so that that's where do you remember Al Leland? He was around you guys. Okay? That had been his car dealership on the first floor of that. It was a Hudson dealership. Sure. Anybody else? Good. Well, again, sorry to jump through this so fast, but we kind of had another chapter with, with Boat Building, and that was kind of the, the next big thing for Kirkland, but we could probably hit that another time. Or if you uh, get one of the books, you can learn a little bit more about it there. Um, I would also add, as long as I'm plugging books, if you want to learn more about the natives um, on the east side of Lake Washington and in the area, David Burgey just had this book come out about two years ago. I hardly recommend it. It's excellent. Uh, it's about Chief Seattle. And then this lady, BJ Cummings, just made this book about the Belongs River, but there's a ton of Lake Washington stuff. Both of these talk about the ladies I talked about at the beginning, um, the two native ladies that were from the Kenan clan, and so the research extensively. This is also a great book about Lee Hunt, but you probably aren't going to be able to find it. It's out of print. I had to have this one custom printed, which cost a hundred bucks. But if you're going to get one, get, get this Peter Kirk book. It's absolutely excellent. And she does a great job. You can read this and fully understand exactly why Kirk came in to be. You have your books here, too? Yeah, I've got my little books over here on the side if you want one of those. I've got I mean, this, one, this one I wrote 10 years ago. I only have one copy. You can get it at the book tree or on Amazon. It's just a compilation of columns I wrote back in the early 1990s for the old Kirkland Courier newspaper. This is a more recent one. It's mostly pictures with captions. We did a lot of books about uh, Kirkland from uh, prehistory up to the beginning of World War II. And then this is um, this is my book. But Mr. Muir wrote this. Chris's um, grandpa, uh, who was in the city council for a long time. He was also a part of the Houghton Town Council prior to 1968. He was a great guy. This is the best story on on modern Kirkland. 
on the government, how we came into the decisions we did about parks and land use and, and what have you. And I mean, Santos Contreras here, um, former city councilman, he had a lot to do with that too, with acquiring parks like uh, Winnie Bay, what happened here at uh, Heritage Park, McCall Park, I'm not doing you justice by all this, but that's basically there's people like that that gave us the quality of life that we have now. So I heartily um, recommend that book as well. Thank you. Thank you.